Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. We started just a few minutes early. Happy to see your faces arriving early. We're here with Yasmin and Ellie and Caroline and Clara and Janet and Travis, our CI team here for the last of the trainings meetups. Um, we're so happy you're here a minute early. We thought we would get going. We want to greet you and hear from you. Oh my gosh, Samira has En-ROADS as the background. I love it. That is so cool, Samira. Cool. Um, all right. So let's, uh, we're going to start with the poll. What's your favorite, what's your name and your favorite En-ROADS slider? What's your name and your favorite En-ROADS slider? Let us greet you uh, and hear. You can add where you're coming from if you'd like as well, but uh, we thought we would change it up a little bit. What's your name, your favorite? And it doesn't have to be your favorite solution to climate change. If you're a bit of a, just a scientist doing experiments and you like moving another one, you can show that. This isn't what's your favorite climate solution. This is what's your favorite slider to uh, experiment with and change. Um, and I assume you're writing in. Carbon price. So many people love a carbon price. It is so powerful. Sam Adams, carbon price, population. Paul says population. Oh, I see Sam Adams carbon price. Okay, Sam, I get it. Uh, Sam Adams carbon price. Joe says carbon price as well. Ian, a carbon price. Boy, people like that one. Economic growth. What if we can meet our material needs in ways that don't just expand our economy and energy use? Population, thank you. So welcome folks, if you're just arriving, we're uh, seeing who's on the call. If you'd write in with your name, and your favorite En-ROAD slider, and we'll get going formally in a few minutes. What's your name? What's your favorite En-ROAD slider? Wolfgang, renewables. It's interesting that slider doesn't improve things as much as we would thought because there's so much growth in wind and solar built into the baseline. Some of the best news out there is how much is already built in the baseline. Economic growth, Michelle, meth methane and other agriculture, wastewater, landfills, oil and gas leakage. The assumptions, there's our scientist, love it. Loves to go in and play with the assumptions. Ar Archen, carbon price, carbon pricing. Nuclear, someone likes playing with the nuclear slider. We calibrated that to the IAEA scenarios. I hope you might've seen the comparison if you like nuclear to some of those others forecasts in the training that we just shared, the training video that showed our comparison to the International Atomic Energy Association. They had a high scenario and a low scenario for nuclear. And we showed you how we're right in the middle of the high and the low in our baseline. Carbon price, again, carbon pricing, wow. So much love for carbon fee and dividend pricing, electrification. Yeah, and particularly combined with that clean electricity standard, what a powerful tool electrification can be. Carbon footprint. So if you're just arriving, welcome. This is the last meetup in the training series. And uh, if you're just arriving, please give us your name and your favorite En-ROAD slider. Closing down new coal, absolutely. Efficiency, a loak from India, carbon pricing. Well, that would be great in India. 
Yeah. Methane and other for the variety of fine tuning. Tamara, great, thank you. We're gonna be breaking that out, the methane and other, by the way. The silent killer, very important to uh, think about methane and other. Growing more trees, afforestation. Very helpful, both because it's a, it is one of the things we can do, but also because, boy, do people exaggerate the contribution that afforestation can make. Compressed natural gas, natural gas in transportation. Fernanda from Spain, carbon price. There should be a hope slider. <laughs> the hope slider is how many people show up to events like this. Stop building new fossil fuel infrastructure. Yeah, all three of them. Crystal, Providence, carbon pricing. Allison, the renewables slider. Okay. We'll have just a few more, and then we're going to get going with the main content here in this meetup. Okay, Duncan says, stop building new coal, oil, gas infrastructure. Yvonne from Switzerland, you love them all. Oh, what a great place to end amidst the forestation, but you love them all, Yvonne. Thank you. All right, here we are. This is the last of the trainings uh, meetups. And of course, we're climate interactive. We work closely with MIT Sloan's sustainability initiative with this training series. And of course, here's what's happening is that you're completing these trainings and we hope on track to become an En-ROADS climate ambassador. People have asked us, when do we get a, uh, some sort of brochure, not a brochure, just a certificate that you completed this course. Well, the certificate of completion comes when you run two events, get feedback from some people in the event and register those events and fill out a form that says, I'm here, I'm ready to go, I'm an ambassador. You can be put on the website if you want. You don't have to be put on the website. Um, you can there also be invited to events we're, that we're going to be holding in the future meetups like this for En-ROADS Climate Ambassadors. So please take the time to become an ambassador. Get your pretty certificate once you uh, do that. Some events that are coming up. Next Tuesday, we're holding a very large online En-ROADS Climate Workshop. Maybe that's how you discovered this in the first place was we've been running these say monthly over the last two years or so. So join us Tuesday and you can see from the invitation, maybe you got the invitation as well. Caroline wrote it, sent it out, but you see the title below, wildfires, heat waves, floods, and the IPCC report. What can we do? That's the hook, but the meat of it is going to be exactly what we've been training you to do, to run the En-ROADS Climate Workshop. So this is not for trainees, this is just for people who are concerned about what they can do to address climate. So please join us, but also invite people because this is a chance for people who might want to have you run one for them to see a general one next Tuesday. We've got two meetups, multi-solving meetup on the 25th, 11 a.m. ET, educators the next day, 11 a.m. Come to one of our meetups next week. If you're in the multi-solving of interest area, or if you're an educator, you can meet other people who are using En-ROADS for those two goals. So today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the training. If you haven't seen it all yet, give you a little bit of a push to take it. Then a lot of you asked in the support site, but also in the last meetup, what does the AR6 mean for En-ROADS? AR6 is the latest report from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You must have seen it in the news over the last couple of weeks. What are the implications for En-ROADS? So we'll talk, in the, talk about that. And then we're gonna engage you about your next steps. Then two threads of work at the hour. We're gonna share um, some more answers to questions if you wanna stick around with us. And then we're also gonna have a chance to go into a breakout room and talk with other people. Um, here's where you are, number nine, you've made it this far. If you haven't watched these video, the, the webinars, excuse me, the training modules, go back, pick through them, look at the ones that you really wanna see. We now have released all of them. 
And of course, this last one was model structure and testing. And just a little push, you haven't seen it yet. Professor John Sturman, who is our close partner with the creation and building of En-ROADS, but also in just the whole field of what 20 years ago, 30 years ago, he was calling flight simulators, which is the approach that we've taken here with En-ROADS. He was uh, my advisor in grad school, Travis's as well. And he has recorded five videos that are peppered through the training now. There's a welcome that you could go back and watch. There's one in advanced facilitation that we added. And then I think three or four in this last one, one of them where Professor Sturman gives you a very technical overview of the model structure. Some other highlights really show you how we use our comparison against others' models to build confidence in En-ROADS. Also, some kind of wild testing approaches like uh, extreme conditions test, where you move things to their absolute extremes, see, can you get your model to blow up? But also for the first time, I, from a bunch of your questions, answer the question, how does En-ROADS actually work? What is it? What kind of model is it? Interesting facts, like it steps forward every 45 days from 1990 for 110 years, how it actually works. What is the Vensim model? And then what is the form that we had to put it into in order to make it software? And some of the innovations that Dr. Travis Frank, who's on the call right now, uh, came up with to make this mathematical model of differential equations accessible to you in its easy form in a browser. All right, so that's just a little bit of overview. Go watch these videos. It's particularly for the nerds and the geeks, particularly for you. All right, so the big update of the week is closely related to the content of the week because the models that inform this report from the IPCC, the integrated assessment models are the same models that we use to build confidence in En-ROADS and that you just learned about. All of that was, um, all of their findings, many of their findings found their way into this big report that just came out about the physical science basis. Now, mind you, this is not about solutions. This is not about how to get ourselves out of this mess. That's going to be a great day, and we'll have a big event sharing what we're learning from that report, but that's not coming out till next year. This is about just the physical science. And Caroline, can you just drop into the chat, maybe you've done it already, the link to the summary for policymakers. It is the best thing for you. If you wanna go beneath the headlines, go flip through it. We'll share some findings. It's a really, it's a somewhat easy read. It's not an easy read, but it's easier than the, the full report. Okay, so here's the question to you in the poll. Would you please share, um, I'm gonna go to the next question here. What, um, next question. When you read that report or you saw the media that came out, about it, so many headlines about the new IPC rep I IPCC report. Um, what did it lead you to think about En-ROADS and its use? Here in the middle of this course, you're learning all about En-ROADS and you're thinking, wait, I'm looking at models. What does this mean for En-ROADS? Does current warming trend change or accelerate? Interesting. We're going to might have to go back because I'm hoping we anticipated some of these questions. Um, but there is, does the warming trend change or accelerate? We need to update some of the assumptions, <laughs> but En-ROADS makes it easy. Absolutely. We're going to show you what we've updated. I thought, great, people have compelling event to act upon. Are there changes to the IAMs that affect En-ROADS? What feedback loops are included in En-ROADS? How can I get my new company to let me run a workshop so they shift away from blue hydrogen? How aligned or updated is En-ROADS connected with the IPCC? It makes En-ROADS more relevant. Yes. Working through a simulation like En-ROADS can provide hope for those who see the headlines. Get it in the hands of every policymaker. En-ROADS is useful. 
It's about the problem while Enron's is about the solution. Great. Will temperature rise again? Please, God, no. How to create a sense of urgency using the tool. Stop the despair. Was there a big difference as to what's already plugged into En-ROADS? We need to act and En-ROADS helps do that. A lot of fear-based news headlines, little focus on solutions. How much more are we locked in? Boy, team, let's be noting some of these to make sure we get to them. There's so many good ones. Oh boy, I'm kind of even losing. Uh, how relevant the model is to moving education forward. I thought En-ROADS C-Rise was conservative. Good question. I want to update your training slides. Urgency to teach people. Do we reconcile the idea of a five-year carbon budget, essential for everyone, unforeseen cascading impacts? How about tipping points in En-ROADS? What has changed in En-ROADS as a result of AR6? These are great. All right, climate smart radar. En-ROADS can build hope that it's still possible to address climate change. Great, it's more relevant. All right, these are fantastic. Um, how do wildfires and methane release affect outcomes now that they are on the increase? Whew. Okay, there are a lot here and maybe our team, which just a lot came by. So maybe LA and team, if you guys maybe pull out ones that you think should be at the top and we'll come back and address them at the end of a little summary. So what I'd like to do is we kind of guessed based on other questions that you asked and luckily you confirmed that this is on your mind. Um, so I'm gonna address several and then we're going to address several that we didn't think of that you just asked. So the main thing was what should be updated? What are the main findings that are relevant? And the main one that is not about En-ROADS but about your messaging there was a very powerful word used. And it's evidence that as our co-director Beth Sawin said, uh, science is working. And science is working when there can be more consensus about certainty about insights and conclusions. And some of the headlines you saw in the press captured that, particularly around the idea that humans are driving climate change. You've often used the number 97% of climate scientists agree. That word, that finding then found its way into this report where it says it's now unequivocal. The human effect on climate is now unequivocal. So you get to have a little more confidence in the fact that humans are driving change. So when and if that does come up, we've given you some tips about how to handle that question. But just note that there's a little more confidence you should have in some of these key scientific findings that we've been sharing for a long time. The one change that's kind of practical is the kind of narrowing of the focus and of certainty. So there's a quote from that report from the PDF you just got. It is, if you're looking for it, is A.4.4 in the report itself about this important variable in En-ROADS. And this important variable in En-ROADS is here in the climate sensitivity to, oh, I think I actually have it, here's the one I wanna show, to a, a doubling of carbon. Let's see if this is actually the one that I want. Um, climate sensitivity to a doubling of carbon. So it's right here how it's been and how it's been in the past, you'll notice this is how much warmer we get when we double the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. Actually, I know that you're, there's a link that I could get. Um, actually, I'll go get it when we get a bit of a break. But what we've had here is this wide range that goes all the way from one up to six. However, this is like the lowest impact that, that CO2 could have to the highest impact where the default number is three. But going back to this finding, what they said was the best estimate is three with a likely range of two and a half to four. So what we're going to do is change it. 
So it's not going to recommend two and a half to four. I mean, excuse me, it's not going to recommend the old range of 1.5 to 4.5, a wider range. It's going to narrow in a little bit more. So what you're going to see in this documentation is going to be um, not in 1.5 to 4.5, but as I just said, two and a half to four. So we get to narrow in those possibilities because there's more confidence that it's a more narrow range. And then we're gonna update this right here to 2016. And in fact, we have a mocked up version that has already been updated there. All right, so that's one of the things that we get is more narrowing and focus and confidence in some of the science. And you'll see that change coming up. The other is that there were some really cool new findings that we're challenging ourselves to see, can we add to En-ROADS? So you saw this cool graph. What is the frequency of extreme weather in every 50 years? And there was a really neat graphic here that was shown that at different temperatures, how often it's likely to happen. If it's present one degree or one and a half or two or three, that these extreme weather events that happen every 50 years, historically, or way in the past before climate change, it would only happen once, you can see then it would happen more frequently. Pardon, uh, 4.8 times 8.6. So this is a challenge to us. Can we get more of this information into En-ROADS? And this is gonna add on to several things that we're adding. And because you guys are the trainees who made it all the way through, I'm gonna give you just a little teaser of some of the new things that we're gonna be releasing and working on. In This is right now in prototype form. Um, Travis, Frank, who's on here, and the team has been had some breakthroughs, both in showing some impacts. Here are some bar charts that we're gonna be able to show some impacts of climate change. In this case, extreme heat and crop yield, not in the current version. Watch for it over the next several months. Also, sea level rise maps, not in the current version. Watch for it over the next couple months. These will be coming out. Stay tuned. We think these are going to be really helpful. But the, what this report did is it really helped us think what is possible when it comes to more of these findings. But the main thing that we really want to focus on here was what made it into most of the headlines. And that is this sentence, these two sentences from that the New York Times covered. A hotter future is certain, climate panel warns, this is the new report, but how hot is up to us? And we think this can be a helpful way to summarize at the end of a workshop, when people really try to get clear about the next 30 years, but also the next 80 years of warming and the just the future. A hotter future is certain, it says, but how hot is up to us? And we wanna just unpack a little bit, dig in and say, how did they, how did the New York Times, Brad Plumer and Henry Fountain come up with that? Where did the IPCC authors come up with that? Unpack it a bit and show how you can see it here in En-ROADS. So we dug into En-ROADS, excuse me, we dug into the IPCC report. Where did they get that? Look in the summary for policymakers, B1 says, this is the sentence that led them to conclude what you just saw as a headline. Global surface temperature will continue to increase until at least the mid century under all emissions scenarios considered. Just that sentence, I wanna focus just on that sentence. That is what led these journalists to say what you saw. A hotter future is certain. It's going to warm through the 2050s. How hot after the 2050s is up to us. In the sentence, how did they come up with this sentence? So look a level deeper and you'll see this diagram. This diagram, because they did say under all emissions scenarios considered. This is showing all emissions scenarios considered, the five of them. So you see this graph, 2015 to 2100, and you see the names here, SSP5, 8.5, SSP3, 
These are the scenarios of shared socioeconomic pathways and then the radiative forcing goal. These are all things, of course, that we explained in one of the trainings from this week where we show these scenarios. If you watch those videos, you may remember this diagram about what we call the SSPs and the scenarios that they're talking about here, which is a story about the future, about how hard it is to adapt to climate change, how easy it is to mitigate, leading to five different stories. We've calibrated many of our baselines against SSP2. We've compared against the middle of the road one here in the middle. But you'll notice that this SSP1 is the 1.5 degree scenario. It is what's called sustainability. Adaptation isn't as hard as we thought. Mitigation isn't as hard as we feared. That is this blue scenario at the bottom. See that? Blue scenario at the bottom. Reaches net zero in the 2050s goes negative down here, SSP1, 1.9. That is the scenario that they're focused on. And of course, we calibrate against those five scenarios. Here are the different integrated assessment models. Nope, they all don't have the same result. They vary. So here are these green lines. See those green lines? Those are all of the SSP1 baselines in green. And then we compare our scenarios against them. So some of what the training will offer you this last week is what these comparisons were. But the point I want to make is really, how did they come up with this conclusion? So they, they watched this scenario for SSP1 1.9, where it, CO2 hits 2050 here, or hits net zero in the 2050s and then goes negative. Methane falls, see the light blue line. Nitrous oxide falls a little bit. Sulfur dioxide, one of the air pollutants falls. They shared this scenario, but then somehow they concluded warming will continue through the, the mid-century. How much it warms is up to us. And so what we can do is go to good old En-ROADS and Dr. Lori Siegel, uh, I, asked, I went back and said, did you recreate that scenario that the IPCC focused on? And she said, yeah, I did. We created that as part of our comparisons. And here's what they did. Uh, and if you could quickly create it, if you like, um, some of, so what you can do is go here to En-ROADS, CO2 net emissions, mid-century by 2050, many ways to get there. Most of those integrated assessment models just take a carbon price and increase it to like $1,000 a ton or so. But we can create it through a kind of combination that you've often created when I've asked you to do this interactively of a carbon price, encouraging renewables, pressure on coal, oil, and gas, extensive energy efficiency, extensive electrification, cutting deforestation, growing some trees. Actually, here they had very specific numbers. They said 80% of potential land here uh, negative 80 to calibrate it really quite exactly to SSP1 1.9. And it took 70% of all the technological carbon removal to create the scenario that they created there in the report. So here are the net CO2 emissions, quite similar, as you'll notice, back here to this blue line, CO2 emissions, you can see going net zero in the 2050s and then negative. This is a creation, recreation of that scenario. Okay, and I'm just gonna grab it, send it to you so you can go check it out. There's a lot you can learn just by going to look at it of what they came up with. You could make it an exercise if people were curious about that report. But let's get back to the main point. The headline that said, Warming will continue. How much is up to us? So from here, go and look at temperature. Go and look at temperature. So even in the most ambitious scenario, here we are, temperature change, 2021, here we are today, more and more and more and more. It's going up. Temperature is rising identically to the baseline, 2028, 2030, 
2036 at so, and it starts peeling away in the 2030s. And here it's warming and increasing and then peaking mid-century. So somebody, when they had that headline, looked and they saw that warming is going up and that there it is, you can look at it, is going up until, and I'll make it even bigger because we added this feature, kind of large right graph. You can see that the warming is increasing and max up, increases until mid-century and how much is up to us, right? So here it's warming up to 1.6 before it comes down to 1.5. How much, we'll see, I'm gonna like close this out. But then they say how much is up to us by mid-century, this is 1.6. But what they're saying is if we hadn't taken all of those actions, we could have seen a lot more warming. So I'm gonna undo all of these actions by pushing the back button. And then you see it could have been as bad by mid-century as 2.1. How much is up to us? So instead of just asserting a sentence like that, you can lead a group or yourself to seeing and unpacking a conclusion like that. That's where they came up with it. That's how they came up with that, that finding. So I'm gonna pause for a second. Um, and there is that important insight that we thought was particularly relevant. We have several people on the phone of Travis and Ellie and the rest of our team. Anything you would add to this one finding that was particularly important? or we're gonna to shift to some of the others that you asked about. And I'm recreating, there it is. We're back to the 1.5 scenario. And you're just a heads up, you're running the uh, dev version. So you can't share those links because people don't have passwords, ah, but we, we fixed it. Oh, great. Uh, so everyone just look into the chat for Janet's corrected link. Thank you, Janet, great. Anything to add to this one before going to some of the other questions that came up about AR6? Ellie or team of other things that are coming up? All right, then I think what from that long list, boy, we got so many good replies. Um, of these, anyone on our team, what did you see as the, they were, there are many more we can, than we can handle right here. We will be around at the end to answer more of the questions. Were there others that came up here that Ellie, you think we should cover or others on the team saw? One, one thing I saw mentioned was uh, that someone said, you know, uh, the IPCC was providing a lot on the science and En-ROADS provides the solutions. That's really true, especially as it relates to this report that just came out last week. Um, one thing to uh, be aware of is that we're gonna see two more reports coming from the IPCC in the next year. One of them will be focused on impacts, adaptation and vulnerabilities related to climate change. And then the second will be much more mitigation focused. So I imagine that uh, by, you know, and that last one will come out in March of 2022. I imagine that we'll have even more changes as that third working group report comes out in March uh, that will really tie directly into inroads. And so stay tuned for that. Great. Great. Yeah, I think we should probably take most of those questions at the end as a way to, to follow up because there's so many good ones that came up. But overall, I think the big message is um, En-ROADS is gonna learn from this report and continue to improve. Uh, but luckily there were no findings that made us uh, wanna change things radically. That's really helpful. And if anything, it should prompt the need for the En-ROADS climate workshop or game or demo or student assignment, whatever you're gonna do with the simulator. If that is all true and now accepted, what are we gonna do about it? Let's roll up our sleeves 
and engage with all of the tests that you can do here in order to orient people towards effective action, to doing all they can to make a better future. Okay, so I think the next thing to do will be to shift on to uh, away from this and more to your next steps. Uh, there's some practical ones, of course, come to the workshop next Tuesday um, and heading into this mode of doing the things to become an ambassador. But Ellie, why don't you take it away with a, a way to really engage people in thinking about what's next? Yeah, absolutely. And if you just stay right there on that slide, Drew. Um, so where we are at, you know, we're culminating all of the these live sessions, all of the modules that you all have gone through and really the next step. And I've seen some people asking about, hey, can we get a certificate uh, for going through the training? If you want a certificate, if that's your thing, uh, if you want uh, to take this even further, this is really where you take these next steps to become an inroads climate ambassador. And what that entails, and we have this written in the training module that is out right now, uh, you can find it on our website as well, is that now that you've gone through the training, you run two events. And during these events, uh, if you can seek feedback from your audience, uh, we really want to instill this culture of continual learning and improvement. So uh, just like we ask you all throughout the training to give us feedback through surveys, uh, we encourage you to do that to, to the audiences that you reach. Um, so to become an ambassador, you run two events and then and you register those. So uh, find the link to register your events and tell us about where you ran them. If they were private, you can check the box to be private and we won't share any details about them on our map or anything like that. Um, then once you've done that, uh, then the, the key thing to then is to apply to become an inroads climate ambassador. And there's the link, Drew, I think is navigating around the website uh, to show you all that, that application. And once you fill that out, Caroline uh, will receive those and uh, give her a few days to, to, to look it over and process it. And uh, then if everything all check, checks out, then we'll send you a certificate and put your name on, our, on the website under the list of ambassadors. Um, when we kicked this whole ambassador program off, we, we kicked it off, let's see, a little over a year and a half ago. It's really quite incredible uh, how much it has grown and how many ambassadors we have. But we had this vision of what if worldwide we had one ambassador for every million people in the world. We have you all are coming and you're joining us from all over the world. And you can see scrolling through uh, the list of ambassadors that there are just so many more areas uh, that we can cover. And we hope that you will join us in these efforts, representing En-ROADS and all the different audiences that you work in and uh, sharing it in all the ways that you all have even started to. So that's, that's really exciting. I'm very excited about that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna post a link into the chat and maybe Drew, if you just, pull it up when I post it in. Um, one thing is I, then I know that some of you are already having plans to run events and you're starting to think about that. So let's just um, check out this uh, Google spreadsheet. I just put it into the chat here and tell us about your next event. Click on it. Uh, it should be open access. Um, and you can see I've kicked things off. I'm telling uh, and just kind of sharing the news about what, what kind of ideas, maybe um, it'll spark some um, interest from others. Uh, you might have to drop down, drop down a few lines uh, to start filling in uh, if you're uh, jumping into the spreadsheet right now. But so for example, I'm running an event tomorrow, uh, um, working with the organization Net Impact and we're um, been kind of coming up with some really cool ideas for future trainings and so, we're gonna be talking to some of their partners and I'll run a workshop for them tomorrow. Um, looks like Drew's filling it in here and Drew's got a, uh, a course presentation coming up. Doesn't know what the date is, uh, let's see, but I'll give you all a minute to fill it in and just, uh, yeah, really excited to hear uh, all the, about the different places. And this is sort of an experiment. Here we are all jumping into uh, this Google spreadsheet to fill it out together. Um, <laughs> and uh, see what happens. But yeah, um, I'm excited to, this to is hear great. about some of these events. Someone at University of Georgia, Tri-County Technical College, Climate Reality, Dominican University. 
Uh, it's working, Ellie. This is great. Good job, Clara. Brett Yeager's and the Destrix Lab. Sharon is doing one in English. Someone in Indonesia. Fantastic. People taking a stand around the world. Others that you see? Awesome. See people running it online and in person. I know that um, things continue to be challenging with running events. Um, it's so it's so hard to know whether it's safe to gather people together or not. But um, you know, over the last year, so many of us and and the ambassadors have found ways to run it well online, and so that's a great way. TikTok Live, I love it. Uh, I want to see some of these new platforms. I would really TikTok love to see. Live. <laughs> That'll be great. Um, definitely tell us more about how that goes. Come circle back to the community space um, there on the, the learning platform and share these events if they happen. And also don't forget to, uh, to register them. Um, we, as you all know, you've gone through all of this for free. Um, and we put a lot of work into this. And one of the ways we keep it free is just by telling funders out there about the successes of how widely spread and all of the amazing uh, decision makers out there that you all are engaging. So do stay in touch and um, uh, tell us about how events are going and send us pictures and um, and also just sharing, sharing the pictures inspires others. So that's really great. Um, the, the spreadsheet is a little small on my screen. Maybe Drew, if you see some others, you can keep reading them out. Um, uh, Malta, yeah. someone in Malta, Guatemala City for high school students, someone in Climate Reality, Milwaukee, Cal State Northridge undergraduate, uh, Ohio State undergraduates, some more out uh, private online. Yeah, people planning a lot for September, some in Singapore, Digital Nomad Sustainability, Energy <laughs> Institute in Singapore. Yeah, this is great. People are filling this in and we're hearing so much. Yeah, and um, if there's anything that you need to make this event successful, I see somebody in the chat mentioning a flyer. Uh, has anyone designed a flyer? Um, put that there into the spreadsheet. We'll look at look through it. We can follow up with you um, or uh, send us an email at support at climateinteractive.org. Um, we're happy to explore different ways in which we might be able to um, Make, make sure that your event oh, is as but successful as possible. The flyer is a great question. I, I know Caroline, you made a whole like media kit or a, are those some of the things that are online? Is it easy to drop a link to that in the chat so people can see? Uh, Cause I think we have some yeah. graphics and descriptions. Maybe you can drop that into the chat right now. Yeah, yeah. And I see another question too of just is there kind of a time frame in which we need to do anything? Do we need to run an, a, a workshop by the end of August? No, I mean, people are signing up for this training in an ongoing way. So I know some of you all are much earlier in the modules and are still working through them. Um, we, I mean, obviously this challenge is critical. We wanna be moving as quickly as we can, but life, life happens. There are all sorts of different kinds of barriers. I know some of you all are working in education settings and fit, figuring out how to fit inroads into perhaps a curriculum or um, schedule it for a certain event. Uh, later in September, I think it's the week of September 21st, um, one thing that's gonna be happening is that there's gonna be a lot of climate events happening. There's Climate Week NYC, which has sort of become a global climate week. Um, so that could be a setting in which you run a climate event, uh, but look for opportunities like that. And of course, uh, later this year in November, um, the COP26 is happening. So uh, an inroads event uh, can be a nice way to tie in these kind of people might be thinking about global climate change and how they can uh, tie in with this big thing that's very far away and uh, running an event can be a way to do that. Um, and uh, I saw, saw in the chat too, some people asking us about our engagement with COP26. Um, we are figuring that out. Of course, the situation with the Delta variant of COVID is an ever evolving situation. We hope to be able to uh, show up if we can and if it makes sense. Um, and we do have a whole team of ambassadors and team members in the UK 
who are doing a, uh, a lot of cool, cool different engagements with schools and other NGOs in the lead up to COP26 as well. So there's already some things happening on the ground, uh, even though uh, for most of the CI team, we're not in the UK. Great. Well, Ellie, I wonder if it's time to move on to some of the staff. Yeah, messages. yeah, absolutely. And kind of uh, thinking about where we sit, you know, we've, I've seen your names now popping up uh, again and again each week. And it's been so exci exciting to start to get to know you all. And I hope that this is the beginning of getting to know you all more and more as you run events and we brainstorm all different kinds of possibilities. Um, and so I just wanted to give a chance to uh, all the other members of the CI team to just kind of share our highlights. We have been pouring a ton of energy into putting together quizzes and videos. We've been engaging with all of your good questions that have come up on these live sessions and then over on the support platform. Um, so I'll get it started. Um, you all know me and, and I guess to, uh, for, for the team members, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit about some of the things that you have done along the way in pulling together this training, just to give people a sense of your role. Um, so my name is Ellie. <laughs> um, you saw me show up in some of the videos, you've seen me show up in some of the live sessions and then behind the scenes, I'm, I'm coordinating and managing um, all of the different moving pieces to make sure it shows up and looks really great. And you guys have a wonderful experience as you go through the training. And one of the things that's been uh, so fulfilling to me to see is our little community space. When I go to you know learn learn where uh, learn climateinteractive.org slash community, and uh, there you every day is like just this long cascade. And it's chaotic, and I can't keep up with all of the different messages everyone's coming through. And I'm sorry if somebody has a great question sitting out there that hasn't gotten a response. But it's also so cool to see how many of you all are out there. So that's been something new that we didn't have before in previous trainings. And it's been great to see how you all have been able to connect and support each other um, along the way. So I'll turn it over to um, Caroline uh, next. Kelly, um, so I'm Caroline. I work on communications mainly. So um, when you signed up for this training, it probably came from something that me and Ellie and others helped put together. So recruiting people and then also guiding people through with uh, emails. And I also work on some of the media, so video editing and things like that. Um, I think my one of my most significant moments in the training or, or helping you guys join this training was early on in one of our live sessions, we jumped into a breakout room and I remember it being me and a few other people who were from Brazil, Mauritius, the United Kingdom, just to name a few of the places. And I was just in awe of people coming from so many different backgrounds all over the world with the same goal, even if their approaches and their expertise and uh, backgrounds were quite different. So um, it really inspired me and you guys continue to inspire me. So thanks for letting me be a part of this. Oh, and I guess I should call on someone, uh, Janet. Hi, I'm Janet. Um, so I've been working on the training program, um, especially working on designing the quizzes, trying to um, think about how, um, <laughs> what I need to learn the model better and therefore what other people might need. Um, and really getting, really all of your feedback has really been helping with that. Um, people reaching out and saying, hey, this concept could be explained better, or um, I don't understand this thing. And then just really helping us think through um, how to make the program better and better. Um, and the other thing is just that this, this work is really inspiring to me. Uh, I remember one of the first meetups we've done in this program, um, I was in a breakout room with one of the trainees from Australia. I think he was an MIT alum. Um, and he was saying, he was up super late at night in Australia time um, and was saying that he took En-ROADS to his daughter's elementary school and was using and was showing it to the kids there. Um, and they were really interested in, you know, this is their future and they're using this model to just, you know, think about designing it. And it, it's really great to hear their stories. Um, next, uh, Clara. Hi everyone. I, I have been working with Janet, I also designing the quizzes and I 
I've been helping also with the setting of, a, of our learning platform. And I've been reading all of your awesome event registrations, um, I had some wonderful stories there. And I enjoyed a lot connecting with, with you all in the training, especially people in Latin America. And I wanna tell you that yesterday I actually went for breakfast with one of the people, one of uh, Maria Fernanda, that is one of the persons in the training. Um, and we had such great conversations uh, also about climate change and roads, but also just meeting each other. That was so great. And we have plans for future events here in Santa Fe in our city. So that's awesome. Thank you. And I'm calling Yazi. Thanks, Clara. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yasmin. I work on uh, a few different things, um, kind of just supporting our users around the world. So that could look like uh, coordinating the translations of our model and our materials, uh, and just trying to figure out what, uh, what people need and, and how we can make it happen. And so something that's really stood out to me in this training is just the support I'm seeing of you all to each other. We've had a couple meetups so far, uh, a Latin America meetup and our business sector meetup. And just uh, from our current ambassadors to our trainees, just the eagerness to support each other and be there for each other, uh, especially because we are such a small team, just knowing that uh, our trainees and our ambassadors and our facilitators are really there to support each other has been really inspiring to see. Do Great. we have an Andrew. Yeah, Drew. Yeah, Drew. <laughs> All right. Well, I think you've heard enough of me on this topic of what's been uh, uh, moving it. Overall, I just want to see this movement win, and you are making this movement towards addressing this challenge win. And so I'm just inspired every day by everybody who's making it happen. And I wanted to shift us to uh, another perspective as we head towards these breakout rooms and these final questions. Um, and the last perspective is particularly coming out of we've been looking at model structure and the nerdy undergirdings of the model itself. But time to step back a little bit. And the person I think who led that best um, was my mentor, John Sturman's mentor, uh, Beth Sawins, Dana Meadows. And am I showing my screen right now? I'm just checking. No. Not yet. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me go back there and make sure I'm, I wanna make sure you see this picture I have. Um, here it comes. Sorry, folks, I lost my Dana picture. Um, so Dana Meadows, who was a Dartmouth professor, she was one of the authors of The Limits to Growth, a system dynamics modeler, mentor, to John Sturman and Beth and me, an inspiration to many of us on our team. And as much as we dig into this model and the use of it, I wanna step us back because there's so much that this can be about with this work that is broader and bigger. And she was the most articulate, I think, about this. So imagine her as a computer modeler in the 1970s, she went to IASA in Austria, the Systems Modeling Center, Applied Systems Modeling Center, their preeminent European modeling center. Very few women at that time, just like very few women in modeling today. But she not only was a pioneer in that, but she really pushed the world about how we can use these simulations for bigger, deeper insights. And in fact, there was a conference. She wrote the conference proceedings and turned it into a book. She called the book Groping in the Dark. And she combined 
the formal mathematical equations of the system, you know, like pictures, diagrams of the global models themselves with thoughts about what it means to us as human beings. It paved the way for the kind of work that you're doing and you just learned to do. In many ways, what you experienced with this course was what she taught and what so many people around her taught as well. But there's something in this book that particularly captures it. And it was in this book that she called Groping in the Dark. Now, first, why Groping in the Dark? Oh, along the way, she and her team inspired this cartoon in the New Yorker in 1972 as the world reacted to the very first model, a kind of En-Roads of 1972. So do you see Chicken Little, famous kid's story, Chicken Little, there's little Chicken Little talking to the farm animals with a system dynamics kind of behavior over time graph. And so, Chicken Little says, extrapolating from the best figures available, we see that the current trends, unless dramatically reversed, will inevitably lead to a situation in which the sky will fall. And of course, Chicken Little was known for saying the sky is falling. This is some of the reaction that she had to deal with in the 1970s. So in 1980, she wrote this book to reflect upon the use of global models, what she call it, the first decade of global modeling. Now, mind you, this was 40 years ago. So now we could say the first 40 years of global modeling leads us to her book. Why did she call it Groping in the Dark? She called it Groping in the Dark because of this ancient Indian story that she included in the conference proceedings with this picture. Someone saw Ness Rudin searching for something on the ground. What have you lost, Mullah? He said, I've lost my key. So they both are on their knees and they've got down and looked for the key on the ground. After a time, the other man said, where exactly did you drop it? In my own house. Why aren't you, then why are you looking here outside of your house? There is more light here than inside my house. And so what she encourages us to do is to look for the answers where there isn't light. She's looking for us, even if the models can't tell us exactly what to do, to push the boundary of what we're able to understand and search for, because we know we need to find the key, even when it's not easy to find the key. We should look in the dark and we should be patient with ourselves and really ask the people that you interact with when they ask you for certainty and for exact this or that, hey, we're all groping in the dark in some degree because that's where the key is. Let's keep looking there. So she wrote a poem about that in the conference proceedings. So here in the very last page, she writes this whole conference proceeding. And at the very end, she includes a final word and it's, here in the appendices of this book. And here is the poem. It's the thing we wanted to leave you with. In the truth sandwich, as we taught you, people are going to remember the first thing and the last. This is the last that we want to leave you with. I hope that it's meaningful. So this is written by Dana Meadows. A final word about the globe is what she called it. She wrote, the most basic message of the global models is not new and should not be surprising. We do not need a computer model to tell us that we must not destroy the system upon which I always get, so Dana died in 2001, uh, way before her time. So I always get, it's hard to read her stuff um, out loud. Um, so we must not destroy the system. It's also just so true. We must not destroy the system on which our sustenance depends. Poverty is wrong and poverty is preventable. 
the exploitation of one person or nation by another, it, it degrades both the exploited and the exploiter. It is better for individuals and nations to cooperate than to fight. The love we have for all humankind and for future generations should be the same as our love for those close to us. If we do not embrace these principles and live by them, our system cannot survive. Our future is in our hands and will be no better or worse than we make it. These messages have been around for centuries. They reemerge periodically in different forms and now in the outputs of global models. Anything that persists for so long comes from such diverse sources as gurus and input-output matrices must be coming from very close to the truth. We all know the truth at some deep level within ourselves. We only have to look honestly and deeply to find it. And yet we don't live as if we knew it. Some of us actively deny messages like the ones from the global models. Others try very hard just not to think about them. Most of us feel helpless, shrug our shoulders, wish things were otherwise, assuming that we can do nothing and go on living. Meanwhile, on this planet, 28 people in 1982 starved to death each minute. <coughs> One species of life disappears forever every day. <coughs> $1 dollars are spent each minute on armaments. Can you imagine how much higher it is 40 years later? The current condition of our globe is intolerable and we make it so. It's changing because of what we decide. It could be beautiful. Remember her rubber band? It could be beautiful if we only would decide to get along together. <clears throat> Be open to each other in new ways of thinking. Remember what is really important to us and what is less so. And live our lives for what which is important. As sophisticated, skeptical, scientific Westerners, we always react to statements like this by saying, it sounds too simple. It's in fact impossible. How could we ever decide to get along together? You don't just decide things like that. How could we get everyone to decide to do it? It couldn't be possible that everyone else is just like us and saying the same thing. When everyone is so sophisticated that they can't believe it could be simple to be honest and to care. And everyone is so smart that they know they don't count. So they never try. You get the kind of world we've got. Maybe it's worth thinking another way as if we cared and as if we made a difference, even if it's just groping in the dark. All right, everybody. We hope this gift to you is helpful. Go get them. And please do Stick around if you want to talk some more with us, but we're also going to open up some breakout rooms so that you can meet some other people and talk a little bit about what's on your mind after going through this last hour together. So we hope you would introduce yourself to each other and say, answer the question, what's coming up? What's coming up after watching this last session and being together and hearing these words? from Dana Meadows. Okay, so yeah, take us away. And of course, we have also reached the top of the hour. So uh, if you need to run, 
run. Uh, we told you it was going to last one hour, but if you've got a few extra minutes, um, Yasmin will open up the breakout rooms and you can join those. And we have the same kind of topical themes that we've used in past weeks. Um, feel free to jump in and join whatever you're curious about, of course. Um, so to join a breakout room, go to the bottom, select breakout rooms, and then hover over the number of people in the breakout rooms and select join. So I see some people already joining the education uh, breakout room. And if you join, just wait there a few minutes, um, give people a chance to find their way into the breakout rooms. So it's that breakout room button, at the bottom of your Zoom interface. And also just, uh, yeah, thank you all so much uh, for all of your gratitude that I see in the chat and everywhere else. Um, we really appreciate you all. And like I said earlier, excited to see where, where we can all go together uh, with these tools and with everything else that we can muster. Um, and we'll stick around too. I know there were some questions that came up in the chat. Feel free to repost them as well if there's something specific you'd like us to touch on um, or question that sits on your mind. Um, and we can try and get to that too. Um, but uh, I see people joining the breakout rooms. So there's a couple people in each one. So definitely go check those out. And if you're having trouble joining the breakout rooms, your version of Zoom doesn't support it, um, just post into the chat and say, hey, I'd like to be moved to the community groups breakout or put me into the public policy breakout and uh, we can move you ourselves. Oh, maybe just the first question, Al, Al is back. You asked a question about the temperature rise in En-ROADS versus the IPCC. Um, you asked that a week ago. Oh, it's good to ask something concrete to look at. Uh, yeah, good question. So what was the Al, the number you saw was like, it, the IPCC, we have warmed, was it one point? Two plus or minus, I think. What was the number, Al, that you were, maybe you could write back into chat. Um, it was 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2 plus or minus, wasn't it? We're gonna pull this up. 1, it was 1.1 1 .1 plus or minus 0.2, I believe. So I asked, I, I asked, um, our model Lori, and what she said was, was this. So go here to En-ROADS. Uh, the, when they're only able to report recent data so that the data they reported was 2019. And so the 2019 data back then, and we calibrate to them, of course, I should have showed you this, uh, the temperature history. Here is our calibration to the temperature history. And mind you, it's important that we don't try to capture year by year numbers because the year by numbers are year by year numbers are going to fluctuate a lot. So here's going up to recent numbers, temperature history, En roads moving along through the middle. You can see there's 2018 data here from NASA, 2018, 2019, 1.27. Here's the NASA upper and lower range. Here we are at 1.24. So you see 1.24 is the number that we had for 2019 recently. And then today in 2021, we're all the way up to 1.29, which is 1.3. So why do we sound different from them? Partly because they're showing past data and also we're not gonna track the ups and downs over time. So Al, that's, that's your answer. Can you show us the sea level rise model? So Katie, I'm not understanding exactly what the sea level rise model is. I assume she is. means the, the maps, but uh, that was the way I interpret that. Like just the fact that you flipped over to the oh. tab there. So to be honest, and now that we're in the post section, Katie, 
I showed those maps so briefly, partly briefly because Travis Frank, who you just heard his voice, is the CTO. He is in charge of releasing these things. And I neglected this morning to say, hey, Travis, how would you feel if I show the prototype version? So I'm about to find out how did Travis feel about me briefly showing and teasing you guys terribly with this. Um, Travis will either say, yeah, show the maps a bit more or Drew, no, let's hold off because I'm going to release it and we'll make a big deal of it, even though these are our trainees. Travis, what do you think? I think I am so proud of everyone for making it this far and just, and to, to dedicating this much time that uh, that if uh, Katie wants to see it, that would be great. <laughs> oh! uh, she deserves it. But just know, Katie, as Drew just said, uh, we I even wrote a couple emails today about how things are going to change. So uh, feedback is welcome. Travis, you just want to say a sense about what we got or what? Yeah, yeah, coming? sure. Yeah. So. Um, First off, I would say we've been working very closely uh, with Climate Central. Climate Central is, uh, you can see it in the footer or briefly there, but climatecentral.org is, uh, uh, they do great sea level rise work. Their sea level rise work is at sea level, I believe, just no rise, sea level.climatecentral.org. Um, and you can actually see a lot of these maps there in, in you know, full view. Um, we have been working with them to incorporate the latest so that it's part of the tool so that you can access um, and zoom around, zoom around the world and see uh, hopefully locales that are important to the audience you're presenting to. Um, we thought it was a good synergy between bringing impacts work that they do a good job of mapping that the you know sea level rise scientists and geospatial people. So uh, along with our kind of more modeling work, so that's that's the goal. Um, it will be available uh, just along with any sort of other output thing like the graph from the graph menu. Uh, and when you do it, it'll load from their server. So it does have a different loading time. It's not quite as responsive as you might be familiar with our usual En-ROADS. Um, and the idea is that the red will show uh, the parts of the land that are below high tide. So it might not be where there's standing water, but importantly, it's going to be the parts that are below, say, sea level rise or below the sea level of that area. So if there wasn't a dike or a levee or maybe high land between the coast and that, this, this land would be underwater. So it is land with, which they're considered, which Climate Central calls at risk. So that's what we're showing. Um, that's what they're showing and that we're including our maps of potential risk um, from flooding uh, or uh, around the world. And uh, we yeah. have tried to build it. Uh, is that good? You want me to stop there? You stop yeah, sharing screen just so you yeah. Know. Okay. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. Yeah. So maybe that's just a quick overview of, of where we're headed with that. Um, others that have come up that any others on our team have seen that we should address or ones that all the way back to the questions about the IPCC report. And while we're waiting for that to go in, when we fully, I see a lot of comments of, can you see places? Can you do, when we will definitely do a more formal release with a, probably a, a standalone webinar when sea level rise maps get released. So look for that in the coming months. Then I think I'm gonna go back to uh, address some of these other questions. Um, So many, boy. Blue hydrogen, that's another thing that's coming. Someone asked, how can I get my company let me run a workshop so they shift away from blue hydrogen? Unfortunately, I don't think we're particularly helpful yet at addressing hydrogen. Um, we haven't added it. We're hoping to add it to the model We'd really like to get it in there, but it's not really strong yet. It's not really helpful yet. Drew, you might, um, just in case uh, that person hadn't seen the latest study on the um, life cycle analysis of blue hydrogen, uh, which hopefully they have, but um, important study that came out, I believe is this last yeah. week. I'll try to find the Edward link and post it. Birnbaum asks, will sea level rise respond to sliders? Yes. That, well, two answers. That is the whole point for us, including it in En-ROADS. It is coupled 
to the sliders. So, um, yes. And um, as you could probably mentally simulate, uh, it is difficult to notice in a map by 2100 in particular, the effect that it's having. As you know, you probably looked to see sea level rise here and notice that as you create a 1.5 degree-ish scenario, oh, I don't like nuclear that much, um, here, and I'm gonna create one, you know, let's get the temperature way down, a lot of CDR, much more than I'd really like, I have to add there. Um, so in this scenario, 1.4 even, notice sea level rise is the same through 2050 and then starts to depart. So there would be, in this case, by this calculation, 0.86 meters instead of 1.1 meters. And the difference between 0.86 and 1.1 in many parts of the world is not that different. Therefore, these maps will not show a significant change. I'll show you the same thing here. So here's Shanghai under in 2100. There again, 1.15 meters. See, that's the sea level rise. And then I'm going to recreate that scenario that we just saw. Um, when we get temperature down, notice now temperature is, or at least sea level rise is down to one meter, one under one, 0.98. When we think of, okay, 1.5. So now we're going to recreate these scenarios for 2100, Copenhagen and um, Shanghai. And some of the reason we haven't included this much or talked about it much is frankly, uh, we don't see much of an impact by 2100. Why? Because there's so much momentum in the system. It's taking so long for the temperature to adjust to the new level of greenhouse gas concentrations. It's taking so long for sea level rise to adjust to the new temperature that we only get um, 0.88 as opposed to 1.15. And the topography of many of these areas is that there isn't a big difference between areas that are 0.88 meters and 1.15 meters. Therefore, the maps are looking almost identical. But if you look closely, they're not actually identical. Um, so we can say more, and there's a lot of more explanation about why it is that the global sea level rise responds so with such delay and so minimally to changes in temperature. Uh, if you want, I can go there, but I, I'm gonna pause myself because this is really about, is it connected to the policies? Yes, it is. One note is we will be adding multi-century sea level rise. And when you look out several centuries, uh, it has much more of an impact because there, the difference between a 1.5 degree world and a, five, and a two degree world matters a good bit more. Okay, other topics that are coming up in this. Could we get a summary of, oh, the, the, the heat, deaths map, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I think I pulled up. This is another feature that Travis and team, Chris Campbell, Adam and Lori and Phil, all of them have been working on quite hard. And I showed it really briefly. What it's going to show you is a handful of important impacts, such as additional deaths from extreme heat, decrease in global crop yield. Uh, we're gonna have species losing more than 50% of its climatic range for these four species, but also for several others that we're gonna be able to show. Now, mind you, again, this is a prototype. It's just a prototype, but we're gonna have that Stay tuned, keep showing to these webinars because at one of them, we're going to be revealing this new feature, which I think is gonna be really great to be able to show impacts for real people. So there's that. Other questions that are coming up? And I...
Anyone on our team seeing questions that we ought to address? Because we might wrap and just put a bow on this thing. Drew, I did see a question, which I'm happy to answer, that uh, people Go were ahead. just asking about if there are going to be more meetups. And we're definitely trying to cultivate different spaces for people to get together and chat. So keep an eye out on your email, on the Learn Worlds platform, uh, on our social media for us to announce further meetups based on different communities that we see coming together. So as Ellie mentioned, next week we'll have a multi-solving and an education meetup. Uh, I saw some interest for an India meetup in the chat. Uh, and in those meetups, we're creating different ways to continue staying connected. So WhatsApp groups, LinkedIn groups. Uh, and so I'll also share those different links uh, in the community space of the Learn Worlds group and through email so that you can continue staying uh, in connection with others. Uh, and so please reach out if there's a meetup that you'd like to be a part of, uh, and we can try to make it happen. Great. Thank you. And, and I, I just also, other sorry, oh, really ahead. quickly add, in addition to that, once you've actually gone through the ambassador program, we have pretty fixed like quarterly meetups as well. So you can expect that if you uh, intend on going through that. So thanks. Great. So some other questions coming up. Oh, Janet handled this in, in chat, but I'll just say for everybody, someone said, oh, that large right graph, it's hidden under here. To get a large right graph, you go to view. Large graph and then boom then you see it isn't that cool yeah and someone else asked about the how to guide people into the social discount rate um i find that very hard as well when you're having people explore the social cost of carbon it's very important to set the social discount rate and we have an explanation here it is a tough concept uh the simple version is is if you don't wanna discount the future much, make it one is what I would say and use one. If you wanna discount the future uh, more, make it three. <laughs> That's the simple version. We'll try to write up some more share, uh, sharing of what it actually means, but there's an explanation here. That's just some guidance. Um, welcome back from the breakouts, everybody. We're still answering some questions. But I think this is the moment when we put a final bow on this. Go become an ambassador. Use this tool in the world to make a big difference. We believe in you. Go get them. And keep showing up because we want you to stay part of this community uh, and stay part of uh, this great group of people making a difference with En-ROADS. All right. If you can unmute and say goodbye in your favorite language. Let's have everybody who's still here unmute. Um, goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.